Lost money, yeah, it takes to get dreams. Relationships are not about rings. Trying to raise a family is so insane. He tries to keep politics off the brain. But sitting in the questions, he might just scream. This is that entrepreneurship is his thing. And there is reality. <clears throat> That's my dad. That's my dad. Daddy, welcome. I'm your guy. I'm your guy. I'm your guy. Oh, this one sucks. BBT, and you can ask me anything. How y'all doing tonight? It is what night is this? Sunday night? Yeah. Wait, I ain't got my watch on. I think it's Sunday night, November 6th. Sunday night. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Let me warn y'all, I'm feeling good. I had some friends over and we had such amazing conversations. I may bring a little bit into this discussion tonight on this YouTube, but honestly, I got a treat for y'all because I got a buddy that this guy is rock solid. I mean, he knows so much about history and I'm going to get him on my show. The only thing about him, he don't want his face on it. So until I come up with some type of ulterior or alter ego form, he ain't going to come on. But I'm going to come up with it because the conversation we had tonight, y'all need to hear about it because the truth will be televised. The truth will be televised. And. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. I got a surprise for y'all. But anyway, I'm going to jump right into this show because I actually think I want to go out and watch Sunday Night Football. I think that I want to, yeah, I want to like get out and mingle a little bit and talk my crap and just mingle with the regular folks. And so I don't want to be here long, but I got a lot to share. So let's jump right into the tweets. Tweet, tweet. Let's jump into it. The first one. From the real Kiyosaki. Elon Musk takeover of Twitter must be working. Not long ago, my last tweet would have been censored. Thank you, Elon. And the new Twitter. Freedom of speech is freedom worth fighting for. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. This is one of the conversations I had with my buddy. Yeah, I think that Elon is changing the game. Don't follow the media narrative. Don't follow the political agenda at the end of the day twitter is a powerful platform that's why i do my tweet tweets when i shut down all my social media platforms and i did it a few times in the last couple of years i i never shut down twitter because twitter is information it's not just information from the mainstream news it's information from you individuals that are studying that are questioning the bs that's been fed to us forever and Twitter is the answer. I truly believe it ain't pitches and trying to make you look perfect and all that crap. It's real life. And I think that Elon is opening the floodgates of real life. And as freedom of speech gets uncensored, which by the Constitution it should never be, I think that we're going to start to uncover some things that can help us all. But anyway, next tweet. Elon Musk, Twitter needs to become by far the most accurate source of information about the world. That's our mission. Shout out to you, Tweet. Elon, Tweet, 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 Tweet. Elon, I'm your supporter. I follow no man. I don't believe in leaders. I believe in people empowering the truth and trying to change the world for the better. I've always looked at you that way. I don't judge your personal life. I don't judge mistakes you made wrong decisions that you have done. I judge your impact and I see what you're trying to do with Twitter and I'm behind you. I'm not following the narrative and you shouldn't too. So next tweet. Code is a friend. Now I'm thinking, do y'all really want things to be better or do y'all just want to take your pain out on another individual? 
Come on, people, wake up. You can do better. You can have more. Every dream that you set, you can have. You just got to set the dream. You got to write it down and make it happen. Stop all this hating. Stop. Stop. Anyway, next tweet. Elon Musk, again, you represent the problem. Journalists who think they are the only source of legitimate information, that's the big lie. And I agree with that. I think for so long, without social media, without the internet, we relied on newspaper. We relied on people who we believe to be honest individuals. But then when you start to see the shows and you watch the movies and you realize the corruption in everything, you start to say, hold up, how can I believe that story that came out when that person was getting paid off? How can I believe that this person is professing the right information that's going to help me make the decision to build a better tomorrow for me and my family? But now I got a world where everyday individuals who are trying to be better and are studying and are researching and are watching and are listening and they're sharing their truth on these social media platforms. That's the real journalist. And I hate to say it, professional journalist. Listen, I'm no professional journalist. I'm no professional blogger. I'm just a truth teller. And if more people study their past and really research what they're being told and put out their truth, we will deal with a real truth. And I think that's what everybody needs. So next week. Kyrie Irving and this, oh, I got cut off. I'm not sure that who it is from, but Kyrie Irving has informed the Nets he plans to retire. I don't know if this is true, but if it is, I applaud Kyrie because at the end of the day, and once again, I go against a really big YouTuber that I follow, that I admire, that 80% of the time the things he say I follow, but he said something recently when you were sign a contract with the NBA, you should just be quiet and wait till your contract's up or don't say anything. Now, I don't believe in that. When you are, woke, uh, are awoken and you know the truth, you can't be quiet because your conscience eats at you. When you look in that mirror, if you didn't tell the truth at that moment, when you knew the truth, when you knew that could help other people, you are part of the problem. And I think Kyrie is realizing that. And if for whatever reason you're going to try to hurt him and hurt his career, it may be time to give it up because he has the platform and he could do amazing things. And the great job he's done in basketball, the championship he won, I think that he could do an even bigger service for the world and for our people if he speaks up. So, yeah, that's the tweets for the day. <laughs> tweet, 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 tweet. Tweet, tweet. Anyway, let's jump into the Hebrew to Negroes, Wake Up America. So I don't know how much of this I'm going to play, but I'm going to play a little bit of it because, man, this book, I'm only on chapter eight. Now I'm on chapter nine, I'm finishing up chapter nine, but I'm going to play chapter eight for y'all. This shit is powerful, man. I don't, once again, I'm in. It sparked me to watch. The conversation I had earlier today, my buddy gave me a movie to watch, another book to read. My my eyes are open wider. My ears are like, poof. I'm, I'm all in. And we had a great conversation. For me, I feel like I define my history. My history starts with me, and it starts with creating a beautiful now and tomorrow, but I cannot dismiss the truth. And once I know the truth, I think it was going it will help me understand me better. And it will help me present my message in a better format. So I don't necessarily learn the truth to dictate my history. I mean, dictate my future. I think I want to learn the truth because the truth will set us free because it will help us understand the why behind what happened and all the years of the misinformation that we were fed, it will now open our eyes to say, damn, 
okay, now I understand. So I can process that and I can move better, more strategically moving forward. So anyway, this chapter is amazing in my opinion. The title of the chapter is Africans and Hebrews. I'm, I'm not going to play it all because it's 48 minutes, but I'm going to play a lot of it. So I'm going to come off camera. I'm going to let it ride. I'm actually going to play it fast to try to get through it much quicker. So listen, if you want to listen, and you should listen to the book in its whole context, please purchase it. It's Negroes to Hebrews, Wake Up America. You can purchase it on Audible or any platform that streams audiobooks. So anyway, I'm going to play this. Let me start with this first. Hold on. I'm going to eat my cookie that my son just gave me because my son loves making cookies. And my son is amazing, my daughter. She'll be faking. She don't be doing that. Anyone want to play this? I'm going to play this at two speed. And uh, let me know what y'all think. I want to hear your comments. Trust me. I don't have all the answers. I'm learning just like you. Trust me. I'm not a history buff. And once again, the comments I had today with my buddy was amazing. But I'm a, I'm a person that win because I figure it out. And... I put everything in place to understand what's going on to try to be better now and moving forward. But I'm also a realist to understand my history matters. So anyway, let me play this. Let's go. Third, black skin in appearance. At the end of eight days, we found a mountain, Hejaz Mountains in Saudi Arabia, which appeared to be 10 or 12 miles in circumference, in which mountain there dwell four or 5,000 Jews who go naked. Does this sound like Africans or Caucasians? and are in height five or six spans, little under five feet, and have a feminine voice and are more black than any other color. They live entirely upon the flesh of sheep and eat nothing else. They are circumcised and confess that they are Jews. And if they can get a more Muslim in their hands, they skin. Hey, really quick. This is chapter eight. It's called African or Hebrews. So definitely once again, get the book, but let me let it keep going. Go. I'm alive. At the foot of the said mountain, we found a tank of water, which is water that falls in the rainy season. We loaded with the said water 16,000 camels, whereas the Jews were ill-pleased. And they went about that mountain like wild goats, and on no account would they descend into the plain, because they are mortal enemies of the Moors, Muslim. Italian traveler Ludovico di Vertima, 1470 AD to 1517 AD. Fact 1. In ancient times and even today, the brown slash black skinned natives of many lands, including some areas in Africa, are shorter than today's average man. The term pygmy is defined as a man's average height below five feet. There are brown slash black skinned pygmies in Africa, Bushmen pygmies, Australia, Thailand, Malaysia, the Andaman Islands, Jarawa tribe, Bay of Bengal, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Negritos, aka Little Negroes, Papua New Guinea, Bolivia, Brazil, and areas in Southeast Asia. The Malay Australoid languages of these brown skinned natives are interestingly related to the language of the large island of Madagascar, which is located on the east coast of South Africa. This shows that there was a linguistic connection to Africa as well as Southeast Asia and the Australian Aborigines. Perhaps the dark skinned people of southern India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and the East Indies are also related to these short, brown, black skinned natives in some way by their connection to Africa thousands of years ago. Fact 2 In Roman times during the Common Era, CE slash AD, Palestinian Israelites were classed among black Africans because it was almost impossible to tell them apart. These black Jews that lived in Arabia predate before 600 AD when the Islamic Empire first arrived on the scene in the Middle East and Arabia to conquer the land of the black Arabs slash black Jews. The Muslims would ultimately gain victory over the Israelites land and over the black Hebrew Israelites living there in the Battle of Kabar, Kabar. The Jews, Hebrew Israelites, living in Arabia during this time were not European Ashkenazi Jews because the European Khazars had yet to convert to the religion of Judaism. The Muslims would kill, enslave, and scatter these African-slash-Arabian black Jews, Hebrew Israelites, as evident in the Arab slave trade that took place during this time. The Quran talks about the success of the Muslims in seizing the Hebrews' land and the victory over the people of the book. This parallels the prophecy of the curses of Israel listed in Deuteronomy 28, 15-68. The Arabs' historical accounts of the ancient Hebrew Israelites. In the Quran, Quran, which is the holy book for Muslims, it describes the victory they believed Allah gave them over the Hebrew Israelites, 
people of the book, which would allow them to subdue and ultimately enslave the Hebrew Israelites during their invasion into Arabia slash Africa starting in the 7th century. Ironically, during the Arab slave trade, Arabs taking black slaves from the west and east coast of Africa would call their cargo the people of the book. The slaves taken from Africa by the Arabs on slave ships call themselves the Yehudi, which means children of Judah or children of Israel. It is well documented that from 600 AD till the 1900s and even today, Arabs have mostly taken slaves from Africa in what is called the Arab slave trade. The Quran, in this sense, would provide undeniable proof that these Hebrew Israelites, or people of the book, were brown, black-skinned people in those times, and not white, European-looking people that we see predominantly today. The black Hebrew Israelites' disappearance is a mystery to many, but it has all been foretold in the Bible. History, in the meantime, since the Bible, has been rewritten, and the identity of the original people of many lands have been replaced by their invaders. It is a known fact that the Arab slave trade consisted of mainly black men and women, taken from Africa, not Europe. This would mean that ancient Hebrew Israelites were black and not white. See for yourself. Quran Surah 2, Al-Baqarah, Ayah 122. Asad, O children of Israel, remember those blessings of mine with which I graced you and how I favored you above all other people. Quran 059.014. Yusuf Ali, they, Hebrews, will not fight you, even together, except in fortified townships or from behind walls. Strong is their fighting spirit amongst themselves. Thou wouldst think they were united, but their hearts are divided. That is because they are devoid of wisdom. Quran 033.026-033.27 Yusuf Ali and those of the people of the book, Hebrews, who aided them, Allah did take them down from their strongholds and cast terror in their hearts, so that some ye slew, and some ye made prisoners. And he made you heirs of their lands, their houses, and their goods, and of a land which he had not frequented before. And Allah has power over all things. During the Arab slave trade, the Arabs enslaved black people from Africa and Arabia, scattering them all across the world, including the Middle East. This is why there is still a black presence in the Middle Eastern countries such as Palestine, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Qatar, Oman, and Jordan. Nobody knows this because the media in America doesn't televise it. Nowhere is it documented that the Arabs in 600 AD enslaved a race of white European Ashkenazi Jews during the Arab slave trade. In fact, it is reported that the Arabs were the first to enslave blacks from Africa, bringing them to the Iberian Peninsula, Spain slash Portugal. It was because of the Arab slave trade that the Portuguese jumped on the bandwagon of slave labor and were one of the first European countries to start enslaving blacks from Africa. Everything the black Hebrew Israelite slaves went through was foretold in Deuteronomy 28 and the scriptures. It is well known by the world that the European Ashkenazi Jews have not been scattered all throughout the Middle East and the world by way of ships as bondmen and bondwomen. What this means is that the curses of Israel listed in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68, and all the biblical prophecies of the fate of Israel apply to a different race of individuals. Hey, let me just say real quick, this this is a bad man. He's put, mixing in the Quran, the Bible. He's doing some research. Like, as a person that don't do this, I don't do this type of research. Like, I read aspects of the Bible, but more of it was I just went with what I was taught, like, this ish is like bomb. It's bomb for me. Regardless, once again, I'm not just going to take what he says. I'm going to watch the movie. I'm going to read other books and then I'm going to compare and contrast. But from what I'm hearing, I can appreciate the level of ex ex expertise and research that he's doing. And I think you should too. So let me let him keep going than those in Israel right now. The Ashkenazi Jews are mainly found in America, Europe, and Israel. In Israel, the Ashkenazi Jews look nothing like the Caucasian Arabs or African peoples that surround them despite the Bible clearly stating the children of Israel intermixing their seed with those of the Black Ethiopians, Black Egyptians, Black Canaanites, Black Philistines, and Black Libyans. These were all nations of brown, Black people. So where are the descendants of the real children of Israel at? It is a known fact that if you ask any European Ashkenazi Jew in America what tribe he or she is from, they will tell you one of three tribes, Judah, most common answer, Benjamin, or Levi. On occasion, if their last name is Cohen or Kohan, will they tell you that they are descendants of the priestly tribe of Aaron, brother of Moses? So where are the tribes of Naphtali, Ephraim, Manasseh, Reuben, Simeon, Issachar, Gad, Asher, Dan, and Zebulun? How come the European Jews know their heritage and the rest of the Jews don't? Something is obviously fishy because God doesn't do things halfway. So if the Hebrews were black, and the sons of Ham, Africans, were black, then how could anybody distinguish them apart, especially if they intermarried with each other, as the Bible clearly says? Could it be that Africans sold into slavery all across the world via the Arab slave trade, 
Indian Ocean slave trade, and transatlantic slave trades were in fact Hebrew Israelites, as stated in the scriptures. One day I was reading the Bible and happened to later watch a documentary on all the slave trades that existed throughout the history of Africa, even some still going on till this day. I remembered watching the news during the Arab Spring 2010 uprising and seeing the fall of dictators from different North African countries. I noticed that the Egyptians, Libyans, Algerians, and the Tunisians were all light in complexion, despite living in the hot desert under the 100 plus degree unforgivable UV rays of the sun. I also saw in the news how the people in Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Iran all looked similar to the people in the North African countries, some even looking more European Caucasian than Arab. I remember seeing pictures of the Jews in Israel at the Wailing Wall at Temple Mount and pictures of the Israeli soldiers. They all looked white like Europeans, but a little bit different than the Caucasian Arabs. I wonder why this was. I did my research on the Islamic Arabic Empire. I remembered that Ham had four sons, Mizram, Egypt, Put, Libya, Cush, Ethiopia slash Sub-Saharan Africa, and Canaan, Israel slash Palestine slash Lebanon slash Jordan. I remembered that Ham was the father of all African races. The land of Canaan was what is now called Palestine, Lebanon, Israel, and parts of Jordan. Fact. Israel is connected to Egypt by way of the Sinai Peninsula. Even though the man-made Suez Canal separates okay. the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, back in ancient times, it was all one landmass. As a matter of fact, Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, Palestine, and Israel all share the same tectonic plate. This means that Israel is a part of Northeast Africa. Europeans, Britain, came up with the term Middle East in the late 1800s, and its popularity continued into the 1900s. For then, there was no Middle East. It's a known fact that the Middle East has no clear boundaries, and for this reason, it is a made-up name. If it was real, having real boundaries, then we should see a Middle West, Middle North, and Middle South on the map. We do not see this. This was a clever way to separate the land where Jesus and the Israelites lived from Black Africa. If Israel, Canaan, was part of Africa, then people would have a hard time proving that the Israelites were not Black. I remember seeing pictures of the Canaanite Levant people and the Philistines from ancient Egyptian artifacts, and to my surprise, they were Black, just like the ancient Egyptians. The Phoenician, Philistine language, and religion were based off of the Canaanite culture. Phoenician was the Greek name for Canaanite, hence the reason why the Canaanite natives called themselves the Canaanite. The Canaanite pagan god, Baal, or Baal Hadad, was worshipped by the Israelites amongst other nations in the area. The Philistines' pagan god was Dagon, the half-man, half-fish god, father of Baal. The Philistines and Phoenicians were both known as sea peoples. The Canaanites, Phoenicians, and the Philistines established port cities along the Mediterranean coastline. In fact, the city Sidon near Tyre, Lebanon, is named after Canaan's first son, Sidon, father of the Zidonians. Anybody from Lebanon now will tell you they are descendants of the Phoenicians, sea peoples. But are they really more descendants of the invading Greeks, Romans, and the Ottoman Turks? Anybody that is from Palestine will tell you they are descendants of the Philistines, who are descendants of the ancient Egyptians, Mizram, the son of Ham, in Genesis 10, 14, Jeremiah 47, 4. The only problem with this claim is that the ancient Canaanites and ancient Philistines were black. The Lebanese and Palestinian people today are not, therefore proving that the people living in these areas now are not descendants of the ancient people of the past. They are descendants of the invading nations that came to the Middle East and North Africa. For this reason, the Egyptians of today will openly admit that they are not descendants of the black Egyptians that built the pyramids, nor will they tell you that they know how to read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. African clues that reveal who were the Hebrew Israelites. I remember how the ancient pictures of the Egyptians and the Nubians, Ethiopia, showed these people to be black, just like what I had thought. I also found proof that there were three times more pyramids in Nubia slash Sudan slash Kush than in Egypt, and that ancient historians stated that the Egyptians were a colony of the ancient Ethiopians who settled north of Kush. So I began to wonder what happened to the original people that lived in North Africa and the land of Canaan. I thought to myself that the only nation of people that spent a majority of its history in the land of Ham, Africa, were none other than the Hebrew Israelites. But who were we? African Americans, Blacks, Negroes, descendants of. There are many Blacks, or people that would be considered Black by skin color alone, scattered all across the world who speak the different languages of their European colonizers, and they do not call themselves Africans, Hamites, even though they share the same common physical characteristics, brown skin, slash tight curled kinky hair of Africans. So I decided to look up the meaning of ham in the dictionary. And this is one of the things I found. According to Zondervan's Compact Bible Dictionary, listed under ham, it defines as such. The youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. Why would the Zondervan's Bible Dictionary say that the Negroes are not from the descendants of Ham? Are we not descendants of Ham by way of Africa and are all Africans or black people really descendants of Ham alone? 
What was Negroland or Negritia doing in the ancient European maps of West Africa? Did the Europeans know that there was a difference between a Negro and other black nations in Africa? Could it be that there were some black nations in Africa that were descendants of Abraham, Lot, and the Hebrew Israelites of ancient times? Black people are surely not the descendants of Japheth, European slash Turkish slash Mongolian nations. This only leaves Shem as another possibility of our forefathers, especially if the ancient Hebrews were people of color in those days. I then wanted to challenge my hypothesis. I asked different Nigerians if they knew they were descendants of the ancient Egyptians, ancient Kushites, ancient Libyans, or ancient Canaanites. They all said no. Then I asked them if they were not descendants of any of the sons of Ham, then who were they descendants of? They had no answer. Then I asked them, who was the only other nation of people that the Bible talks about dwelling and living in the land of Ham, Africa? They said, the Hebrew Israelites. I asked different Africans what they referred to black people in North America, Central America, and South America as when speaking about us back in Africa. Some of them said that they referred to us as the people of the book or the children of Israel. I have heard this statement from other African Americans as well. The Africans today say that we are a lost people who lost our heritage and don't even know who we really are. They said that once we got to America, the Europeans called us African-Americans or Negroes to make us forget who we were and what we really were called in Africa. All the Europeans wanted us to know is that we were from Africa and nothing else more. I told them a lot of slaves were taken from Central and West Africa. Then I asked them if Africans living in Central and West Africa were also the descendants of the Hebrews. On each occasion, they all sat and looked at me in silence with amazement that they had never thought about that possibility. I told them that if Ham was black, then Noah or his wife had to have been a brown black person as well. I explained that if Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, were white, then where did people with brown black skin people come from? If Africans living in Central, West, and South Africa are not descendants of the ancient Ethiopians, Egyptians, Libyans, or Canaanites, then it would only leave one explanation. They are descendants of the ancient Hebrew children of Israel who settled in Africa years after the Exodus, after the Assyrian captivity, after the Babylonian captivity, and after Solomon's temple was destroyed by other invading nations. Ask anybody from West or Central Africa these questions, and they will most likely tell you they are not descendants of the ancient Libyans, Egyptians, Ethiopians, or Canaanites. Could they have lost their history passed down from generations just like other descendants of black slaves scattered into the world? The Ethiopian royal family and the late Emperor Haile Selassie were supposed to have had the oldest records of their ancestry dating all the way back to King Solomon from the tribe of Judah. Some still speak the oldest form of the South Ethiopian Semitic language called Ye'ez, dating back to 4 AD, which has its roots to ancient Hebrew and Aramaic. The Ethiopian Jews of Beta Israel were still following the commandments of God written down in the first five books of the Bible, Torah, before being introduced to Babylonian Judaism, Talmud slash Kabbalah, Christianity, and Islam. Ethiopians are one of the only African countries that didn't experience complete European colonization, even though some admit the Italians under Mussolini did accomplish this for a short time, and numerous invasions by other countries as the ancient Egyptians did. The Egyptian dynasties were also ruled at times by Nubians, Ethiopians, and Libyans before the Greeks, Persians, or Romans ever stepped foot on Egyptian soil. Before this period, all of the Egyptian pharaohs were black. The pictures on the walls of ancient Egyptian structures prove this to be true. The Hamitic people of Africa, the Hebrew Israelites, and their offspring through intermixing at some point were subjected to slavery and scattered to the four corners of the world, just as the scriptures say. The slave trade by the Portuguese, Spaniards, French, Dutch, British, Europeans, Jews, Arabs, and Indians is one of the main reasons why the Afro presence is seen all over the world. People living in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain slash Portugal, back in the day, even documented how dark the Jews slash Hebrews were. Here are a few quotes from historians concerning the Jews in Spain and Portugal. Waits says, an interesting gradation of all shades down to the black is exhibited by the Jews. Especially dark were the Jews of Spain and Portugal. The Portuguese Jews were very dark, says J.C. Pritchard. The Duchess de Bronte, wife of Napoleon's ambassador to Portugal, said that the Jew, the Negro, and the Portuguese could be seen in a single person. Book, Nature Knows No Color Line. So dark were the Jews, especially of Portugal and southern Spain, that many whites thought all the Jews were black or dark. Many of the Jews who were banished from Portugal by John II settled in the West Indies. John Bigelow, who visited Jamaica in 1850, saw the descendants of these Jews and says they were Negroid. Nature knows no color line. Pages 123, 130. In 1510, black slaves were transported from Spain to foreign Spanish colonies in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, South America, with the permission of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, Catholic of Spain. The Casa dos Escravos in Lisbon, Portugal the government slave trade agency, sold more than 1,200 Negroes between 1511 AD and 1513 AD. The emperor of Austria and king of Spain, Charles V, granted licenses to his trusted and favorite courtiers to transport African slaves to the New World. Fact. 
During medieval times, many Gentile Jews of other nations, by Judaism conversion, migrated to North Africa, Spain, and Portugal. They lived amongst the real Black Hebrew Israelites and Black Moors in southern Spain slash Portugal. After the Spanish Inquisition, these Gentile Jews migrated back to North Africa, Israel, Europe, the Americas, and the Caribbean. Of course, they were not taken there on slave ships. They enjoyed a good life while the real Black Hebrew Israelite Jews endured slavery on these Spanish-controlled islands. But this was predicted in the scriptures. So these Gentile Jews maintained their heritage, taking over the title as Jews, while the real Black Hebrew Israelites would lose, forget, their heritage during slavery. Genesis 9, 27. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents, territories of Shem. This proves that no matter where the original Black Hebrew Israelites went, via slavery or migration in exile, the Japhetic Gentiles were soon to follow, i.e. invasion, slavery, colonization. The children of Japheth were prophesied to dwell in the Black lands of Shem and Ham. This is why the Japhetic Europeans invaded Israel, Africa, India, the Caribbean, and the Americas. These countries were all areas the children of Shem, i.e. Elamites, Israelites, were scattered into. Jeremiah 17, 4. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. The changing, renaming of boundaries, the changing of languages, and the changing... All right, so look, I'm going to fast forward it because I don't want to ruin the book for you. I am going to fast forward it towards the end of the chapter. And then, like I said, feel free to purchase the audio book and definitely uh, get your own perspective of it. I have actually listened and I have mine and it's fascinating to me. But like I said, I don't want to ruin it for you and I don't want to take sales from Mr. Dalton, Ronald Dalton Jr. But I just want to share, if you're unfortunate or you don't have the ability to buy this book, I wanted to share a little, little bit with you. Um, I'm actually cutting out some parts that I really wanted you to hear, but I don't want to take up too much of your time and I have things to do. But definitely, please, please purchase this book. So I'm going to go to the last, about the last five minutes and I'm going to play this part. So let me let it go. Wilson, Western Africa, its history, condition, and prospects, 1856, page 216. Mixed up with these pagan nations and customs, there are many obvious traces of Judaism, Karakt, both in northern and southern Guinea, and in the latter, some undoubted traces of a corrupted form of Christianity, which have probably traveled across the continent from ancient Ethiopia, where Christianity was once firmly established. J. Layton Wilson, Western Africa, its history, condition, and prospects, 1856, page 220. 15th century writer Leo Africanus, 1494 AD to 1554 AD, was an Andalusian, Spain, Caucasian Moorish, Muslim, diplomat, and author of the book Descripción del Africa or Description of Africa. In his travels, he traveled throughout Africa all the way to Timbuktu, Mali, when it was known as the Songhai Empire. In his book, he wrote about a powerful Hebrew Israelite kingdom in the 15th century, 1400s. He describes this Hebrew kingdom that was located to the right of the Nile River. Here is a quote from his book. How be it they say that upon Nilus, now river, do inhabit two great and populous nations, one of Jews towards the west, under the government of a mighty king. Leo Africanus, The Description of Africa, Volume 1, page 32. Leo Africanus also talked about the Hebrews living amongst the Songhai Empire during the 15th century in West Africa. Soni Ali was the first king of the Songhai Empire and the 15th ruler of the Soni dynasty. After the Hebrew Israelite turned Muslim Songhai king Soni Ali died in 1492 AD, his son, Sunni Baru, was supposed to take the throne. Sunni Baru refused to convert to Islam and declare himself a Muslim. So Muhammad Tureh, one of Sunni Ali's generals, challenged him for the throne. Muhammad Tureh was successful and took over the Songhai Empire in 1493. He later became known as Askia Muhammad I or Askia the Great. Leo Africanus describes Askia the Great's hatred for the black Hebrew Israelites living amongst his newly acquired Songhai Empire in what is known as Mali, Africa. The king, Askia the Great, is a declared enemy of the Jews. He will not allow any to live in the city. Gao slash Timbuktu. If he hears it said that a Berber merchant frequents them or does business with them, he confiscates his goods. Leo Africanus, The Description of Africa. The rule of Islamic caliphates over the black Israelites, Jews, and the conversion of the black Israelites to Islam while in their migrated home in Africa was foretold in Deuteronomy 28, 36. See for yourself. Deuteronomy 28, 36. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods. Allah, wood and stone, dome of the rock, Kaaba. 
So the question to ask ourselves here is, if by statistics, 99% of the Jews worldwide are white Europeans, then where did all these black Jews in Africa come from? These are not Ethiopian Jews, whom these Arab historians are testifying to have met while in Africa. These Africans did not convert to Judaism by traveling to Israel and then coming back to Africa with a new religion. Did the disciples of Jesus minister to the Africans about the biblical Mosaic law, Karite Judaism? The African Jews were following the law of Moses from the Torah and practicing Hebrew customs before Christianity or Islam entered into the continent of Africa. White European Jews cannot turn black in the sun, nor can they have black children. The original Jews had to be either black or white. This means somebody is obviously lying about who the real children of Israel are. History doesn't lie. So there you have it. There you have it. That was chapter eight of Hebrews to Negroes, African or Hebrews. Definitely pick up the audio book or purchase the book or you can watch the movie. Like I said, I'm not going to watch the movie until I finish the book. I have about, about 30 hours left. I can knock that out in a week. Definitely, you want to get your own perspective. Movies are obviously shortened. They're made for movies, so they're going to entertain you a little bit more. So I always recommend read the book first. So, yeah, I'm feeling what I'm hearing. Like I said, once I get the information, I got to go and do my own due diligence, my own research, cross-reference with other movies. But, hey, that's why we're giving the mind to think for ourselves, think independently, and that's how we that's what we should be teaching our kids. So before I wrap up, I want to play a video. We add it to the stream. I want to play a video for Mr. Kyrie. So let me let this go. Go ahead. For you when I was uh, a kid, figuring out that uh, 300 million of my ancestors, the traumatic events of my familial history and what I'm proud to come from and why I'm proud to stand here and why when I repeat myself that I'm not going to stand down, it has nothing to do with dismissing any other race or group of people. I'm just I'm proud of my heritage and what we've been through. So, you know, these same questions that you guys ask, me dealing with it as being a melanated, pigmented person all around the world and dealing with racial biases against my skin color, demeaning me because of my religious beliefs. And I'm still sitting in the seat standing human being that's 30 years old and I've been growing up in a country that's told me that I wasn't worth anything and I came from a slave class and I come from a people that are meant to be treated the way we get treated every day so I'm not here to compare anyone's atrocities or tragic events that their families have dealt with generations of time I'm just here to continue to expose things that our world continues to put in darkness I'm a light I'm a beacon of light it's so what I'm here to do. You guys ask me questions about basketball, I give you my expert opinion. You guys ask me about other things, I give you my opinion, and it's met with whatever you believe the perception or the deception is. I know the Oxford Dictionary, you look it up, right? It's one of the biggest mistakes I had in being a kid was not knowing European or Western language. Until I started looking it up and understanding the definitions and why they say, if you want to trick a black person, put it in a book. I was wondering my whole life why they said that. Now I'm 30 years old and I know reading is a superpower because it helps me understand where I'm going and where I come from. It's like a tree with roots. Yes, yes, yes. Reading is a superpower. Reading is a superpower. Reading is a superpower. Yes, yes, yes. They don't want to hear you. They don't want to let you hear that interview. Kyrie is just exploring life. He's learning. Come on, man. Leave the man alone. Anything, if you watch any of my shows, there is nothing I have played that has suggested hate from Kyrie. There's nothing I've said that suggested hate to any group. Like he said, I'm just 
recognize and realize in my history. Do you see me? I'm black. A lot of our history was hidden from us. We got Black History Month. There was never any talk of Juneteenth. There was never any talk of Black Wall Street. There was never any talk about anything that I've been talking about in the last couple of weeks. You know why? Because they don't want us to know our history. And it's sad. They throw some figureheads out there. Martin Luther King. Hey, non-violence, 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 non-violence. Nah, man, that ain't our history. Nah, Holmes. Nah, Holmes, that ain't our history. Our history is deeper. It's so much more. We're so powerful. We were amazing. We are amazing. So don't knock this man. Let him be. Let him learn. Let him explore and let him share. That's how we grow. Support him. Stop vilifying him. He's not bad. He's not doing bad things. He has a platform. And he's outspoken. He's not so caught up in the fact that I make a million dollars and I'm supposed to shut up and dribble and not share. Nah, nah, home. Nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to speak my truth. So, yeah. Shout out to you, Kyrie. I appreciate you, young man. Young man, young man, you're teaching me. You're teaching me. And I'm teaching my kids. And I'm teaching my culture, my community. And that's how we grow and that's how we build. I had a conversation with my buddy. He don't think it's going to change no time soon. Like, nah. Nah, Holmes. Nah, Holmes. You got people like me. You don't even know who I am. But I'm a person. I'm a, I'm a spark. Something is something. And we're going to build on that. If I got to go out with that mentality, that's how I go out. Because at the end of the day, if people before me didn't sacrifice, I wouldn't be able to sit in this house behind this bar, in front of this camera, in front of these lights, without them. So I got to do my part, and I'm going to do my part because that's what it's all about. And you, you, talking to you, you, you got to do your part. Fuck your check. Fuck your status. Fuck your house. Fuck your comfort. Fuck that shit. It's about teaching the next generation to be more impactful, more powerful, understand their value. And unfortunately, they took our history away from us, but we getting it back. We getting it back. <clears throat> we getting it back. <clears throat> we getting it back. <clears throat> so you think a yay and a Kyrie and any socially conscious independent artists like Coda are in vain? Nah, man. Nah, Holmes. Nah, Holmes. They building a better tomorrow. That's what it's all about. So anyway, before I wrap up, I'm going to give y'all some visionary moments from BBT. So the first one, five years ago, I said, we managed to make Stay Woke a joke. We got all the answers. And I'm humble enough to find the correct ones. We continue to play by the same rules to a game that was never meant for us to win. And we're teaching our kids the same mentality. We're not happy, but we're not in touch with self enough to figure out why. So we talk about others doing worse and chase things and people to cope. That realizing those things will never make us happy. We have no clue what true freedom is. Our time is our most valuable resource, yet we never try hard enough to be in control of it. I'm a poet, y'all. I'm a poet. I don't want fame. I don't want it. I just want to empower my people. Next. Next revolutionary shit, not revolution. Next visionary moment from BBT. Five years ago on this day, I said, why do we get off so much talking bad about other people, especially our own? I just don't get it. Yeah, we seeing it. We seeing it. We got Kyrie. We got Ye they're speaking out. And they're anti-Semitic. They're bad people. Yeah, I don't condone that. You ain't even watched the video, LeBron. You ain't even watched the video, LeBron. You ain't even read the book, LeBron. You ain't even read the book, Shaq Barkley. Come on, guys. That's why I don't follow no man, man. I looked up to you guys. That's why I'm I'm actually kind of glad. It's, it's a it's a catch-22 because I'm teaching my kid how to play sports, and I wish he would watch a little bit more so he could be better. But then the back of the, the, the other side of me is like, nah, man, he doing he all right. When I get out there and we teach, I want him to be better because physically he needs to push himself. 
But now you don't need to know that. You don't need to follow no celebrities, no entertainers, stuff like that. Just be at peace with who you are. Enjoy who you are because, unfortunately, we follow these people. And a lot of them are corrupted. They're bought. They're not going to turn on mass. It is what it is. So, yeah. Anyway, next revolutionary vision, every moment from BBT. My goal in life is to keep setting goals in life. Man, I love my life, man. Regardless. If anything ever happens to me, watch this video. I love my life. Every struggle I had, I love it. And I will always love it. And I just want you to love it. I have set goals to have everything I've ever wanted. And I've got everything I wanted. And I think that sometimes the ego gets in the way. And you get caught up in what everybody else got. And you believe that success is what they got versus what you feel and who you are. And for me, life is good. And obviously, I know the tests are coming. I already know, like, the more, every time I say life, it's like with my relationship. If I tell somebody my relationship's good, the next day, me and wifey fight. Or if I say life is good, next thing you know, a bill pops up, and I'm like, fuck, I'm going to pay for that. But I'm good with that. That's that's the part of the journey. Struggle is what it is. So, yeah. But I think that's it, y'all. That's it. That's it. Those are the revolutionary, revolutionary, visionary moments from BBT. I am getting up out of here. I think I might go out and watch some Sunday Night Football. I hope you're having a great Sunday. I hope that you have set your goals for the week. and You're ready to bust them out and bust them up. Because that's what we're supposed to do. Dream fucking big. Like so big that no one believes it to the point where your dream's so goddamn big that you don't tell nobody. Because when you tell people, all they're going to do is say, you're crazy. You can't do that. Yeah. If you look at my life, and you might think my life ain't worth much because you've never heard of me. I look to my right. I look to my left. I'm a bad MF because I saw it and I'm living it. And no matter what happens, I experienced it. That's all that matters. So I'm out of here. I hope you have a good night. Peace. <laughs>